I like it when uh, like I have crutches and, I, and I'm broken and people are nice to me. So I don't actually need these crutches. This brace is fake. I'm just going to keep wearing it because everyone's been so nice. So uh, it's good to be back. I am going to try and do this. Uh, in, my, in my head, I had this vision. And, and uh, it, it's like a fireside chat. You guys ready for like the old sit around the radio? I wanted to find one of the pipes that used to blow bubbles. You guys remember those? You know, they don't sell those anymore, like not even on the internet. Something about kids and smoking, you know, I guess. But uh, so I had envisioned, you know, blowing some bubbles from my bubble pipe and us sitting together in heaven, just a little time from the word. Is that okay? Can we do that this morning? Okay. Three or four of you are okay with that. All right. So we're all going to hang in here. I don't think there's any children's shirts. I'll get the high side back there. So kids, you're in here. Kids, feel free. If you got to get your wiggles out, but you got to get your wiggles out right there because you're not going to children's church. I see Corbin's like, you're stuck. Sorry, all right, so we're going to be together this morning, we're going to have just a time in the Word, and so if you want to start heading to Psalm chapter 30, the 30th Psalm, that's where we're going to kind of camp out for a little bit this morning. Again, thank you guys for uh, praying for me. Uh, we, we thought about, Todd and I thought about staging a little Benny Hinn action and, and him like, you know, blowing on me, knocking me down, and me running around, but honestly, we, we can't do that because I can't. If I, if I get down, I can't get up, and I won't run. So I uh, so did have surgery, in case you're wondering, and you, maybe your guest is wondering, like, why is there a guy in shorts and flip-flops uh, sitting in a chair saying he's going to preach to us? This isn't my normal MO. Had my ACL replaced. Scared a few of the kids this morning, told them I had a dead person's ACL in my knee, and, and they kind of stared at me, and it was, it was a good story, good time. Uh, but had the surgery, everything went well as far as I know. Uh, and so on the road to recovery, again, thank you for the prayers and the encouragement, and we'll just keep heading that direction. So hopefully in a week or two, uh, we'll be back to dancing in the aisles like we normally do. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Let's do it. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to be, again, Psalm chapter 30. I was thinking about, as I was sitting at home uh, this week under heavy, heavy medication, about what we should talk about uh, this morning and uh, begin to think about the time of year that it is. We're going to have trunk retreat in just a few hours. That's a time for us to kind of open this place up to our community, hopefully build some relationships, uh, and kind of use, in, 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 just to be honest, use this time of year to our advantage in terms of reaching out to our community, showing them what, what, what true love, what true hospitality, what true hope looks like. None of it found in the decorations, none of it found in the candy, and any of that kind of jazz. All of it found... Uh, in our hope that is Jesus Christ. And so we get to do that here in a little bit, but begin to think about that. And so the kind of the idea of this the, the trick-or-treat in the Halloween season, that was kind of in my mind as I was thinking about what we'll talk about this morning. And ran across Psalm 30, and it all seemed to kind of, kind of fit. And so that's kind of the theme we'll talk about, uh, this idea of, of trick-or-treating. You guys know kind of where trick-or-treating started from? All right, we get some ideas. We've probably done it. We've probably seen it done different ways. The concept, the idea of trick-or-treating, and really kind of being tied to Halloween, it's over a 1,000 years old. Right? It goes all the way back to the Celts and the Druids, you know, and it was very, very pagan. Right? I know here at church we're talking about Jesus and the Bible, and, and Pastor Matt's talking about paganism. Well, it, it started out very much pagan. Uh, you know, they thought the dead spirits would come back, and so they put out these treats, and they'd set up banquet tables wanting to appease the spirits, and then some people would put on masks to try and scare off the bad spirits, and it was very much, you know, kind of steeped in, you know, in the flesh, you know, in, in occult type stuff, very dark type, you know, scenarios, and, and, and that would play out, and it played out that way uh, for many, many years, many, many generations, and then along comes the truth of God's word, and along comes the hope of Christ and Christianity, and, and with like a, lot, a lot of things that we celebrate today, this idea of trick-or-treating, Halloween, this was all kind of sanctified in many ways. Instead of fearing evil spirits, they began to pray and thank God for their blessings. And so the, the trick-or-treating went from setting out, you know, banquets and treats to war off evil spirits to have what they call little soul cakes. And if you go to people's houses, they give you a soul cake, and in return, you would pray for that house. And so you would go around, that became kind of the, the treat, right? And so there was less tricking and more treating at that point because they turned it into an opportunity to pray for each other and to love each other and to celebrate the gift of Jesus Christ. So you fast forward through the years, we find ourselves, found this picture, this is from like the 1930s, if you can see it up there on the screen. And everything become, as it always has in our culture, very Americanized, right? And so Americans were kind of rowdy by nature. And so the trick part kind of came back. They said the trick or treat kind of came from 
youth and young people of the time deciding that was a good night to go out and, and kind of wreak some havoc and, and uh, play some pranks and things like that. And so that's where it's kind of developed for us in this idea of trick or treat. It seems like there's kind of a, a dual nature to it, right? Mischief goes on on Halloween night, but for a lot of folks as well, like they'll do this afternoon, they're going to come and they're going to get treats from people as well. It is a little ironic that 364 days a year you tell your kids what? Don't take candy from strangers. And then one night you send them out into the neighborhoods and say, get as much candy from strange people as you possibly can. Do it. Go for it. Right? Turn them loose. And so there is some ironies in that. But begin to think about, again, all this wrapping up into kind of that dual nature, that trick or treat, and how it really applies to us even spiritually as we are, as we are in the spirit now. Right? But we still war against what? We still war against the flesh. And there's some tricks of the flesh and tricks of the world that we can get caught up in, and we've got to focus on the trees, the spiritual blessings of God. All right, so this is kind of an encouragement maybe this morning, using the season, using some of these concepts, just to encourage us to avoid the tricks, right, pursue the treats. Uh, and again, I kind of maybe you saw there for a second, I, I put this kind of filed under my leadership uh, series, and we'll be going kind of back to that, and really for the, for the church, for us, this is going to be geared towards those of us who have our, our faith and hope in Jesus Christ. We've got to focus on these things, and, and we're going to see at the end of this psalm a good reason why. Because as we focus on the treats and the spiritual blessings and the nature and the character of God, it really does have repercussions in the world and for the world. And we're about to, again, invite a whole bunch of people to come and see us, and we're going to give them treats, and we're going to love on them. They need to come, and they need to see Jesus in us, right? They don't need to get the tricks that the, that the world continually doles out to them. They need to come here and find the spiritual blessing that is faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ. So we're going to work our way through Psalm 30 uh, real quick this morning. Again, there's going to be a lot we're going to kind of hint on, talk about. Won't have time to get to all of it. I'd encourage you, if you have time this week, go back and read through some of these Psalms. I'll give you a few other scripture reference, really, that won't have time to go and read. So it's kind of that, you know, by the fireside. We'll, we'll tell some stories here in a minute. Uh, go and read them this week and, and see what the Holy Spirit has for you in that. Uh, and so again, Psalm chapter 30. I'm going to figure out how to do this fitting down here. I've got notes, but we may not need them. We'll just see how that goes. All right. Whew, can you guys see that? Oh, yeah. My screen back there is really dark. All right. And so we're going to start. Yeah, sorry. Well, that's why I got a Bible here. Uh, so we're going to start again, Psalm chapter 30. Uh, and before we actually get into the psalm itself, I kind of want to just start with the title. So if you're in Psalm chapter 30, right, mine starts out, says, The Blessedness of Answered Prayer. And then right underneath that, it says, A Psalm, A Song at the Dedication of the House of David. So we're going we're gonna to put a pin in that real quick, because you see on the screen here, it's going to be kind of split up. It didn't label it necessarily, but you see on one side of the screen, there's going to be what I think is kind of the trick uh, and the other side is, is the treat that offsets that. Uh, and so the, the trick up there would actually be to go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Now, again, we don't have a lot of time this morning, so we're not necessarily going to go back there. But I love the book of Ecclesiastes. Who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, by the way? Solomon. Yeah, that was a really non-committal answer. Okay, it's okay to talk this morning. I know I haven't been here in a week, but remember, Pastor Matt loves it when you talk back to him. Uh, not in a sassy way, but you know, answer the questions. There you go. I got kids for that. Uh, so, so <clears throat> Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. So there's great kind of symmetry here as we're going to be in a Psalm of David. And then for a minute here, we're going to grab some, some wisdom from his son, Solomon. But if you go to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, maybe you get a chance to read it this week. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, Solomon begins to list out all the cool stuff that he has. Right? And if you go and he's like, man, I've got houses and I've got money, and I've got land, and I've got orchards, and I've got food and drink, and Maseratis, and Lamborghinis, and all kinds of whatever. I mean, he had everything of the day. He's got servants. He's got armies. Solomon has everything a man in his flesh could ever want, right? If, if, if it was attainable, he attained it. Uh, he, he would go and get it. People would bring it to him. You can read stories about the gifts that these different rulers would bring to him. Tons, tonnage of gifts that they'd bring to Solomon. He had it all. And I love what he says. You see it there, verse 18. And I'm going to turn around and read it real quick because I can't see it from that screen. Right? But it says, Then I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun because... I must leave it to the man who will come 
after me. Think about that for a minute. He had attained everything, he thought, everything he'd ever want or need, satisfying his flesh, satisfying that trick in the flesh right, in every way possible. But then he comes to this realization that all that cool stuff he has, he's got to leave it behind. Right? We leave this place, but the stuff stays where? Stays here. You know, I, I like going to auctions. I thought about this this week, going to estate auctions. You know, and there's always cool stuff to be found at estate auctions. But here's what I've noticed at estate auctions is the majority of the people who are buying stuff are really old. Okay? And I mean that not disrespectful, but you think about it, most of the people who are buying it up, buying it up, buying it up, look like they're probably going to have their own estate auction in, in a short amount of time. And I, I've thought about that. It's like they seem to be at the end, and they're just gobbling up and, and, and scooping it in as much as they can. They're trying to get more and more stuff because their time grows short. And, and to me, that's a trick of the flesh, is that we get so wrapped up in the things of the world, and, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, not having the right house, not having the right car, you know, money as a status symbol. We've got to have a certain size bank account. Uh, and then you, you get frustrated when you don't have what you want, and then you get frustrated when you, when you feel like you might lose it all, right? Have you ever had something taken from you, something stolen from you, right? Maybe you had your house broken into or a car stolen. How did you feel? And you were angry, right? And, 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 and it just gnawed at you. But it's just stuff. Why do we get so angry and so worked up over stuff? Because the trick of the flesh is, in this world, especially in our culture, Stuff is what gives you identity. Stuff is what gives you hope. Stuff is what gives you security. And the truth is, it doesn't do any of those things. All right? And so Solomon, as he's writing in Ecclesiastes, that's his ultimate point, by the way. He's not telling you, get all the stuff you can and try to outdo me. All right? By the end of the book, he goes, man, he starts off all is vanity, and he ends up, it's still vanity. Right? It's just stuff. All right? And so back to the opening of Psalm chapter 30. Why don't we bring that up? Well, it says, a psalm... A song at the, uh, at the dedication of the house of David. Uh, and so what does that mean exactly? That's kind of uh, uh, maybe some debate here. But uh, if certain translations doesn't use house of David. Certain translations uses the word temple. And if you go back and look at that word house, it can and, and oftentimes is translated as the word temple. So it could be something like a dedication or a psalm uh, over the house of David. Because of what David talks about in the psalm, we'll get there in a second, I don't think that's what he's doing. I don't think David is, is looking to dedicate his own house towards the Lord. He's in a much more humble disposition than that. It could have something to do with, with the ark or the tabernacle. But because certain translations favor that word temple, here's what I think is going on in Psalm chapter 30. David's gone through some stuff. Okay, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. He's experienced some hardships, hardships that he brought on himself. And as he writes out this psalm, here's what I believe that David is doing. He's no longer looking at the world. He's no longer looking at stuff. Right? And you guys can probably piece together some of the things that David has done that would fall into that vein. Right? He chased after money. He chased after women. He chased after power. Right? But he gets to this point now where he goes, I'm going to write a dedication to the temple. I'm going to write a dedication to the name of the Lord. And why is that significant for David? What, what's going on with the temple in David's time? Is there a temple in David's time? What, yeah, what, what, was, what was the desire of David's heart? David desperately wanted to build that temple. And God told him, no. And there's reasons. We don't necessarily have to go into that. You know, we can talk about that later if you want. But God basically says, listen, David, it's not for you to do. But it was so the desire of his heart. He got all the materials ready. He drew up all the plans and all these things. And here he writes a dedication for something that's going to happen in the future that he knows he will not be a part of. But his vision and his purpose is now beyond stuff and beyond himself and beyond that very moment to what God will do in the future with future generations. And so here's the treat, I believe, in this. And this is kind of the trick or treat I put of vision. The treat here is that for all of us in this room that are in Christ, we ought to have the vision of what God is doing beyond us. Right? 
David invested in the next generation. David invested in the temple, even though he didn't get to build it. David is writing a dedication to this temple, even though he'll never see it, because he knows what God will do in it and through it and what it will mean for his people. Do we have that kind of vision? What's it going to look like? How are we going to invest in the next generation of this church? All right. What are we doing now that is promoting Christ for, for people that are yet to come, even when we'll be, we'll be gone? What investments are we making? Remember, David got all the materials, all the building materials ready. He used all his wealth and authority, called in all his favors to get that ready, even though he wasn't going to build it. Instead of hoarding all that stuff for himself, concerning himself with his own money and power, his vision was for the future. What is next? What is God up to? And how can I be a part of that? Again, as Christians, especially as those who desire to, to lead in that and grow in that, that must always be our vision is what is next? What is God up to? And how can I be a part of that? Because that should be our vision and our desire. And so let's keep rolling now. Let's actually get into the psalm. <clears throat> we'll try to pick up some, some speed here for a second. And so uh, it starts out, again, we'll read the first three verses here. It says, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. And so here we're talking about kind of the trick or treat of, of what I would say, the trick or treat of mercy. Right, what is David referring to? What's the whole psalm referring to? You know, why do I go back and say I think David's looking forward to the temple? I think that this psalm is in response to something that David did, written about in Scripture, that really changed his perspective about who God is and who David is in front of God. And that was a, an incident that involved a census. Anyone ever read that story? Okay, 2 Samuel, see the, the reference to there, 2 Samuel chapter 24. And again, maybe you guys want to go back and read that this week. There came a point in David's life where he took a census of his people. Now, we're going to talk about why he did that here in a minute, so we'll kind of hold on to that. But basically, that was a no-no. Right? That was something that David should not do, and he didn't really have any business or ultimately really authority to do that. And so it kind of kindled the anger of God towards David. And because David represents God's people, it was, it was anger against David and God's people. And so it came to David that, listen, David, you did something wrong. You did something bad. And again, we'll talk about the roots of that here in a minute. But, but he was basically given an ultimatum. He got to choose his own punishment and discipline. You guys ever employ that as a parent? Be like, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punish you because I love you. And because I love you so much, you actually get to choose your form of punishment. That's really like a no-win situation, right? And maybe you've been a child in that situation to go, you know, A, B, or C, which punishment do I choose? And you're trying to figure out which is the best punishment, right? Some of that's just psychological punishment, right? And so I don't think, you know, God's necessarily being cruel here, but he goes, here, here's basically your options, David, all right? You can endure famine. You see up here, uh, again, verse, verse 13, you, you can endure seven years of famine for your people, right? You can be chased around by your enemies uh, for, for three months, okay? Or your people can endure three days of plague. You know, this is, this is sickness and disease that would end in death. And so David has a choice to make. How many of you guys would love to, to sit down and have to make that choice? David, as, as leader of his people, I either have to endure famine, right, have enemies come and chase us around, or I have to watch my people die of sickness and disease. Which one does he choose? You guys remember? He chooses the plague, right? And, and I always thought, you know, initially reading, I always thought, to me, that was almost like the selfish choice. Like, why would, why would David choose that, right? Because, you know, David was wrong. David should be the one that gets chased by the enemies and, and all this stuff. But as I was reading through Psalm 30, Reading through, again, 2 Samuel 24, I encourage you to go read that. It kind of became clear to me, and this was part of the commentary as well, that David chose the only option that fully relied on the mercy of God. Because if he chose famine, he'd have to go where to get food? The neighboring cities, the neighboring peoples, evil people, wicked people. He'd have to beg from them. He had to owe them favors. He'd have to pay money out to wicked kings and other rulers. He would owe them and be in their mercy. And David says, I'm not going to be at the mercy of, of men. 
Same thing with that second option. If my enemies chased me around, I'd be at the mercy of man not to kill my people or take my own life. But a plague, a disease like this, the only one then I, would, I could cry out to and the only mercy then I could rely on would be the mercy of God. And as you read through that chapter, what does David do? He does that very thing. As his people are dying, as they're suffering, David falls to the Lord and says, listen, I did this. Take my life, spare my people. You know, show your mercy on my people because only you can stop this, God. And ultimately, that's, that's what happens. God doesn't take David's life, but David builds an altar and, and God leads him through these steps of repentance, right? And, and, and it's made right and he's restored. And as you read those verses back in Psalm 30, he says, I will extol you, Lord, for you have lifted me up and not let my foes rejoice over me. God gave David the option, even though that discipline was harsh and it hurt, it was necessary, but there was always the option to fall on the mercy of God. The trick inside of this is that when things get rough or when we bring about punishment on ourselves, you know, we've been talking about in 1 Peter with suffering, right? When we bring things upon ourselves, there's always the temptation to try to fall on the mercy of man or culture. You know, if I go out and I can earn some more money, I can make this right. If I can go out and, and, and you know, sometimes just go out and, 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 and get drunk, go out and do drugs and, and deaden that pain and fall on the mercy of that. Right? If I can go and borrow or, or steal or whatever that is, and I think that I could go out amongst men and culture and find the mercy I need to endure, it doesn't work that way. Because that's where enemies are. That's where the foe lives. Instead, we've got to throw ourselves upon the mercy of God. And that doesn't mean that God goes, okay, you're forgiven, no consequences. 70,000 people died from that plague. Can you imagine bearing the weight of that as David, knowing that 70,000 of his people suffered and died because of something that he did. He was king. He was the man. He was the one that got appointed. And so his decisions had far-reaching consequences, and that's something that he learned in a, in a very harsh and desperate way. But now you get things like Psalm 30 where David says, I understand it now, and I fall on the mercies of God in the mercies of God alone. He says, you've kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. And, and that's going to be important as we get to the end of Psalm 30 about why it's important to David that he still gets to be here. Even though he petitioned God to die, God says, no. Right? And, and so David realizes there's something that he's going to be about because he's still here, because God's left him here and he has a purpose. So again, the trick of the flesh is that we would, we would find mercy and, and grace in this world, in this culture, it's not there. Always, always, always we must fall on the mercies of God. Amen? All right. And so let's keep rolling. See, we're picking up speed. I like it. Okay. Uh, and so let's read verses 4 and 5 together. It says, Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks to the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Again, this is tied directly to what we just talked about. And this is, to me, in my mind, kind of the trick or, or treat of spiritual discipline. And you can include that word suffering. Again, we talked about this uh, with, with First Peter. And you see there, specifically, verse 5, it says, For his anger is but for a moment. And this is, Weeping may endure for a night. How many of us have ever felt like God has turned his face away from us? that we have earned the scorn and the anger and the rejection of God because of our actions. I'm going to guess that most of us in this room who have walked with Christ any length of time have felt at some point like God's abandoned us or rejected us. I can imagine David feeling that way as he is throwing himself on the mercies of God going, I've, I've done wrong, I've messed up, I've hurt my people, I've hurt myself, I'm broken, and God must hate me, and God must be against me, and rightfully so. And maybe, again, you've had that conversation. I've had those conversations. I've, con I've convinced myself that I've, I've messed up and God has a right to hate me, to reject me, or to dismiss me. And you know what? That language, that feeling, okay, that, that voice whispering in your ear, that is not God. We have an enemy that would love for you to think that. We have a flesh that's always warring against the spiritual treats and blessings of God that would love for you to run away from God. And David, no doubt, feeling that way, he takes each one of those, of those phrases, you see that first part of the screen, 
Okay, and he, he's going to kind of he's going to temper those with the truth. He's going to put them in their place. It says, for his anger is but for a moment. Yeah, you might incur the wrath and in, 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 in maybe some of the, the redirection okay, and, and uh, some of the, 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 the needed correction from God. But it's for a moment. Right? You might need the spiritual whooping, but it only lasts for a moment. His favor is for life. How do you know if you have God's favor? How do we attain God's favor? How hard must we work to get God's favor? How long does it take to get it? How much money does it cost? None of those things. God's favor is given to us when? When in, in humbleness and brokenness, we accept it. Right? And you say, oh, we have the choice to accept it. There's a whole other conversation there. God wills it for us. We've got free will at some point in our lives where we put our will aside and we submit to his. Or we can live our whole life pushing against the will of God, the gift of God. I believe that God grants that as a gift. And when we realize our, our broken nature, we humble ourselves, right? And, and yeah, we use that word, accept it, right? If you've been granted the favor of God by God, you have no power and authority to do anything with that favor. And what David reminds his readers and probably himself of is that if I've been given the favor of God, it will never be taken from me. There may be times of discipline, there may be times of anger from God, there may be times of correction from God, but they're just times and they're just moments. Remember what Peter told his, his church about suffering? It's limited. It's for this long. It's for a time. But in light of eternity, in light of who God is and his character and nature, you have his favor and he loves you desperately. As Christians, we need to be reminded. We're always talking about, we've got to tell the world about the love of Christ. I think we need to remind ourselves just as often about how much God loves his people. You have his favor. And even if you've been disciplined and felt his anger at times, no, you've not lost the favor of God. Weeping may endure for a night. Uh, maybe you've had those nights, those days, but joy comes in the morning. And what is the morning? The morning is always a promise of something new. And God, God is in the business of new things, making new things out of old things. And so the joy comes in the morning. And that's the spiritual treat. That's the spiritual blessing. But even through dark seasons and hard times and discipline and some of that anger and wrath, you have the favor of God. You're his child, and he is doing something new and great in you, and that's something to find joy in. What is David trying to say? Listen, I messed up. I did something terrible. My people are suffering. I'm falling on the mercies of God. But I know that, that God is merciful. He is gracious. And so I can have hope and joy that God will do something great out of that scenario. Out of, again, what we talked about from 2 Samuel 24, that census. All right. Moving on. Moving on. Verse 6 says, Now in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was troubled. And this, I think, goes back to the motivation behind the census to begin with. Why did David take a census? David wanted to know how powerful he was. Why would you take a census? What would be the point? Especially back then in that culture, you want to know how many men you have in your army. You want to know how ready and fit you are for battle. And again, you want to know basically what kind of power you wield. There's only one problem with that. Those armies and those men in that power, who do they belong to? They belong to God. David took them for that moment for himself and said, let's just see how powerful David really is. And in that pride, in that selfishness, in that false sense of security, right? David was looking over his vast kingdom. Like Solomon said, all these things I've acquired for myself. And that's when God came to him and said, listen, you've got it wrong. All right? And you see there in verse 6, he says, now in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. And this is the trick or treat of security. How many of us have tried to find security in ourselves? In a position at work, inside of our own family, even positions inside the churches, right? You know, I've, I've met pastors and I desperately don't want to become one. That, that term pastor, that's their security and that's their authority and they wield it as such. 
That's dangerous. All right? Again, you know, your bank account might be your security. Your stuff, your material might be your security. You may be looking around about exerting your authority and influence, and that becomes your security. And David, at some point in his life, said, look how secure I am. I mean, giving himself a big old pat on the back. But it comes to this realization, again, I believe through <clears throat> this scenario that, that we were talking about with the census, he says, Lord, by your favor, your favor, you made my mountain stand strong. What did David come to realize? His security can, should, must only be found in God. This world will, and I don't even say can or should, it's happening, and it really, in some ways, probably must happen. Take things from you that you place your security in for the purpose of growing you as a child of God. You know, we talked again about what's going on First Peter and, and what was going on with the government back then. You know, we've got people, love you to death, they put a lot of faith and hope in things like guns and their Second Amendments and the Constitution and government. Okay, and I'm not, here to, I'm not here to downplay any of that. I'm not here to be the anarchist or anything like that. But the truth is, if you have so much hope in the, in the Constitution of the United States that it gives you security, it's misplaced. The Constitution is not Scripture. It is, it, is a, it is a document written by man. And if other men come and they want to take your rights away, you know, people are going to be upset. People are going to fight. They're already talking about it. Truth be told, for the Christian, our hope and security is in Christ alone. So if they, do, if, you know, if they do away with the Constitution, if they do away with your, your rights granted to you by government, that doesn't change your security. Our hope's in Christ. David says, you hid your face and I was troubled. David came to the realization that he was trusting in his own power, his own government. And when God's face was hidden from him, he realized God's face was hidden from him. What was his reaction? I was troubled. And I'm going to guess it's a pretty mild word, troubled. That sounds like David might have been up thinking about it for a couple hours. And I'm thinking it's probably a bit more hefty than that. David, David was distraught. David was beside himself. David went, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm, I'm a nerve hanging out here open in the wind, right? I've got no security, no protection. God's hidden his face from me because I've withdrawn. I, I've backed off from it. I try to put faith and trust and hope in self instead of God. And again, the spiritual blessing of being in the favor of God is that no matter what happens in the world, even our own stupid decisions, if we will fall on his mercies and cry out his name, he will make us to stand strong. He will make us to stand strong in him, in his power, in his authority, and in his control. The rest of the psalm, we're going to kind of wrap up uh, I'll go ahead and read through it, but, but again, we'll kind of tie some of this back to what we've talked about. Uh, so let's read it, verses 8 through 12. It says, I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood? When I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. I love what he's talking about in, in, in verses kind of 8 through 10 there. And this goes back to why did the Lord spare David? Right? When David says, God, take my life, right? take all that plague off my people, off your people, give it to me. Demand my life, I'll lay it down and I give it. But God didn't do that. Right? And he thanks God for sparing his life. And then I think he kind of makes this, this realization, and, and again, another point of rejoicing and being thankful that he's still here. He says, listen, I want to cry out to you. I want to give you glory. I want to praise you. He says, what profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? David realizes again, maybe renews the vision and purpose he is here for the glory of God and to give him praise. And as long as he is here, what is he going to do? He's going to praise God. He's going to speak the name of God. He's going to fall on the mercies of God. He's going to proclaim it. Right? He says, will the dust do that? Will the rocks cry out? 
Listen, while I'm still here, that's what I believe Dave is trying to say, while I am here and God has granted me breath and life and God give me as much of it as you will because I want to use it to make your name known and to glorify you and to praise you. And so a question came to my mind that if my voice, you know, my life were suddenly silenced, would that change the volume of the amount of praise being given up to God? That is to say, would my voice be missed when I leave this place? Again, David, I think here, talking about purpose, talking about legacy, talking about what's coming after him, David wanted to be missed in the sense that when he finally was called home, when he finally died, that the, the, the roar of praise being given to God would, would fall down just a notch because David was so passionate and so loud that it would be missed. The dust, the air, the absence, that's not going to praise God. I'm going to praise God. And that's a, great, that's a great question for ourselves. Me being here in this life, on this planet, even in this place this morning, if I were not here, would I even be missed? Would the praise of God, with the amount of praise being lifted up, would that even change? Do I live my life in such a way that I am constantly giving praise and glory and honor to God? And you see that in verse 12, to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. David went through a tough, tough time. This deal with the census, the hurting, you know, the, the, the plague on his people, the, the hurt that they incurred, the death and destruction that it brought. But he's learned some powerful, powerful lessons, some, some treats, spiritual blessings that we ourselves can take for ourselves and apply to avoid the tricks of the flesh and of the devil. Fall on the mercies of God. All right? Fall on the mercies of God. Know that you are highly favored, highly loved. Find your security, hope, only in God. Even when you've messed up, even when you know you've done wrong, you find your security in him because he still loves you and he still wants you as his child. And then live your life in such a way that if you weren't here anymore, your voice would be missed because it was constantly lifting up praise and glory to God. Amen? That's how we ought to live our lives. Again, as David's writing, this is a dedication to the temple, to the name of God. David says, let that be us. As we stand before God, as we stand before the name of God, as we claim the name of God, let this be us. And not just for him, not just for the generation that might have read that when he wrote it, but for his son, Solomon, and for generations to come all the way till today as I'm sitting in this chair reading to you Psalm 30 about let us declare and praise and give glory to the name of God. Let us not fall into the tricks of the flesh like David did, but cling to the treats of spiritual blessings that are there for us to take hold of. Amen? Let's end with a time of prayer. I have a few announcements and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Father, we love you. Father, I thank you that I get to be back in this place, back with my, my church family. Father, I thank you for uh, the love and support that I've received. Father, I thank you that, again, we get to be in your word. And I thank you for the wisdom of your word. I thank you that um, we can open it up to any page, Father, and we find truth for living. Father, I thank you for David and for his heart to write this psalm. I pray that uh, we would live it. Father, we would know that uh, for those of us who are in Christ, that, that desire to, to honor God, that even when things don't go as planned, Father, we have the right vision. Father, we're not sidetracked by the world or the stuff in it. Father, the poor decisions we may have made in the past don't define us. Father, we, we fall upon your mercy even this morning. For those of us who need it, Father, we would pray that it would, it would fall heavy upon us. Father, we would accept the discipline because we know that it comes with love. Father, we thank you that we find great security and comfort in you. And Father, let our voices lift up praise to you so much so, Father, that when they're finally silenced in this lifetime, it's missed. Father, let not the dust or the rocks outdo us in praise and bringing you glory. Father, again, I thank you for these folks. I thank you for this day that we get to uh, 
bring people here, invite them to, to your house, to this place that you've given us. Father, I pray as families come in on this campus, Father, that we would seek to build relationship. It's not about uh, a candy treat. It's about a spiritual treat. There's a lot of folks who are going to bring a lot of baggage, a lot of tricks of the flesh with them. Father, I pray that you would, uh, even now, send your spirit to be with them. Uh, Father, that to work on them. Father, that they would find that this is a place where spiritual healing happens, where we get to meet with our Father who loves us. Father, that there will be opportunity for us to make your name known and be a great and powerful testimony for you. Father, again, we love you. We thank you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, hey, before we head out, I got a couple of quick announcements for you guys, and then we're going to start getting ready for our afternoon activity. It is Trunk or Treat. If you're a guest with us and you know all these weird things are happening, right? You had, had to endure Pastor Matt's legs. I'm sorry. Okay, they probably not have a good tan, but uh, it's already been a weird day, so just stick around. It's going to get more interesting because we're going to do Trunk or Treat. We're going to set up some booths and tables. We're going to have opportunities for people to come and play games and get treats. If you want to come be a part of that, come be a part of that. It's our opportunity to build relationship. But here's how it's going to kind of play out. When we're done here, we're going to kind of migrate next door. Uh, I believe we're going to do the potluck in the multipurpose building. Anybody want to confirm that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we'll have that next door potluck, multipurpose building. We'll eat a quick lunch, and then we're going to get things set up. If you are doing a trunk, it's already been kind of laid out. Kimmy has all the layout. Please don't pull your car up there until you know exactly where you're going to park it because it's a little bit different. We're having to avoid some of the puddles this year. Uh, so we'll go next door. We'll have lunch. Find Kimmy. She'll let you know where to be. But we can start putting things into position. So the times for this is 3 to 5. Truth be told, we'll have people pulling in the parking lot about 2 o'clock. All right, we'll have people at 2.30 walking up, wanting to go ahead and play games and that kind of stuff. And so really, if you are doing a trunk, if you're doing cotton candy or popcorn or, or anything like that, if you're going to be a part of that, we need you in position, ready to go at 2.30. Okay? Uh, and so that way, people who come early or even some of our folks, if you have kids and you'd like for them to go through so they get to play some of the games, you can do that as well. 3 o'clock, we should be in full swing. We normally have anywhere between 300 and 500 people show up. We'll see who comes. Uh, we're praying for those numbers. There are some other trunk retreats going on, so that could hurt or help us. Uh, honestly, if, if people come through, I know Grace Place is doing theirs at 5 to 7, I think. And so you encourage them to say, hey, there's another church right up the street. right? Go hang out with their Jesus people too. Uh, and, and they can go to that trunk retreat as well. Um, I think Choctaw Road is doing one as well. So lots of opportunity. You know, It's okay to tell people, go to that one too. Go see those people. Go love on them and get love done. A um, couple of quick things I will ask for. Um, obviously, if you're running in your trunk, you got to be there. Uh, I know a lot of people sign up to bring their own candy. We have some candy in reserve. If you need candy, talk to Kimmy. Uh, we need people who are going to help be on trash duty. Um, we'll have some bags from the popcorn and cotton candy uh, and bottles of water that we need uh, you know, trash receptacles for. So if you don't have a place or something to do, if you could just keep an eye on trash cans or picking up trash off the ground, that would be greatly appreciated. There's going to be some setup that needs to be done. Um, can't do it this year. We need some other people who can step in and, and move some things around, set some things up. Uh, one thing I will say, too, <clears throat> uh, we got a few cases of bottled water. We like to provide that every year because people are walking around as the sun comes out, gets a little bit warm. We need more bottles of water. Um, uh, so if someone would be willing to, right after lunch, maybe run down to Dollar General, I'll give you uh, the first $20 will come from Pastor Matt. They had the cases of water for, for like $4 for 30-something bottles of water. Need to buy probably about six or eight of those uh, to go with what we have. And so if you want to pitch in a few dollars for bottles of water, come find me. If you are the one willing to go get those bottles of water, come find me. But I'd love to have plenty of water because we're going to have popcorn, cotton candy, and, and all the candy being given out. We want to make sure that we're, we're giving people opportunity to stay hydrated, even our own people as well. All right? Uh, am I missing anything? I see Miss Kimmy there in the back. Um, most of all, honestly, let's have fun. Sometimes we get kind of wrapped up in these and we get all kind of hectic and bent out of shape trying to get this put together. Let's have fun with it, right? I'm going to put on my Hawaiian shirt and a fishing hat, right? I'm going to be a beach bum because I can't move around. I'll be running one of the stations. I'm just going to have fun, okay? Um, I won't take any, you know, narcotics so I'm all loopy or anything. I'll just, I'll be sane and, and coherent. But um, let's have fun with it. You know, if you're going to dress up, dress up, you know, and go, you know, it's that time of year. We're not celebrating 
any kind of pagan anything. We are celebrating the gift of God. He's given us this place. He's given us this people, opportunity to build relationship. We're going to sanctify it. We're going to use it as an opportunity to make Jesus known. And that's exactly what I want to challenge each of you to do. In your booth, tell people Jesus loves them, right? If you have opportunity to have a conversation, have it. If you've invited people to come before you leave this room, stop and pray for them so that they can come and feel like this is a safe and secure place where they can meet people who care about it. All right, have I missed anything else? Shoebox. We have an announcement for Shoebox. November 24th, the shoe packing, shoebox packing party. And we have some here if you want to take one home and start your own. Okay, so November 24th, we're going to do it up here in the Fellowship Hall. In this building, Fellowship Hall, we're going to have our shoebox packing party. If you aren't familiar with shoebox, shoebox ministries are awesome. You get to pack the shoebox full of toys and trinkets and other wonderful things for kids. It's also an opportunity, again, for the gospel to be given away, and we get to ship those out. You guys, if you were here and you heard Ariel talk about her experience getting to go and pass those out, great opportunity for the gospel. So be prepared for that as well. Anything else for today? If you got questions, if you're totally lost and confused, I'll be up here. I don't move very fast, so you can come up here and grab me, ask me questions. But for everyone to be involved. So you're like, oh, I don't know if trunk or treats for me. We need you. We need you. All right? Again, if you can go get water bottles for me, come find me. Let's talk about that. So as of right now, let's be dismissed. Let's start moving to the next door building. Don't pull your cars up there just yet. All right? Let's do lunch, and then we'll do trunk or treat.